This conference will now be recorded. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patricia Hine. I am the past chair of the ACRM NDNG um, Networking Group. Um, very excited about this webinar that is under the uh, NDNG webinar series program. This webinar is also sponsored by one of the very active task force from our NDNG group. Uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Task Force has been extremely um, proactive in providing education and web pages and uh, as well as um, information education pages. And without further ado, I would like to have the podium to our task force chair, Dr. Julie Fayetta. Good morning, Dr. Julie Fayetta. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, and with that introduction, I'll briefly just mention a few things about the Alzheimer's Disease Task Force, and then I will have the opportunity to introduce our speaker. So just briefly, the Alzheimer's Disease Task Force encompasses a number of different experts representing multiple fields. You will hear from one today. We're involved in a number of projects. Um, several of them are consumer targeted projects, such as the information education pages that we have and are producing. Um, we're also involved in more strictly scientific work. We've recently submitted um, an article and are continuing work on a scientific review on the impacts of exercise in Alzheimer's disease populations. We are also engaged in multimedia knowledge translation efforts, and you'll be able to take part in one of them today in this webinar. And so we're excited to reach out and, and connect with both consumers and the scientific community regarding um, research in dementia and aging. So without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Elena Filippo. Dr. Filippo is an Associate Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics at the University of Niswa in Cyprus and a visiting lecturer at King's College in London. Dr. Filippo is mainly interested in studying how diet can prevent degenerative disease and more specifically the effects of the Mediterranean diet and carbohydrate manipulation on cognitive function and cardiometabolic factors. She's published several papers in international peer-reviewed journals and is the editor of a book titled The Glycemic Index, Applications in Practice by CPR Press. She's an active member of the National and European Networks of the American Congress of Rehabilitative Medicine Neurodegenerative Networking Group. She also practices as the registered dietitian, providing private consultations to adults and children on diet-related issues. So with that, it's my privilege to welcome today's speaker. Thank you, Dr. Filippo. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to give this webinar. It's really a privilege for me to be able to share uh, some information and some dietary tips with everyone. So without further ado, I will move on to the, to the uh, webinar. Just would like to remind you that if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat box and we will answer them at the end. So our topic today is dietary patterns to slow cognitive decline. And some disclosures just to start with, that uh, there are no financial interests and, and um, the ACRM doesn't have any financial interests either. So the learning objectives for today would be to discuss the evidence relating specific dietary patterns to cognitive function and decline, discuss the possible mechanisms involved, uh, discuss the outstanding research questions, and provide, of course, some practical dietary recommendations for the mature brain, but also for everyone. And the reason we're here today is because there are more than 131 million people that are projected to be living with dementia by 2050. And in actual fact, every three seconds, someone in the world develops dementia. But two out of three people actually uh, globally believe that there is little or no understanding of dementia in their countries. So what characterizes Alzheimer's disease, which is the main form of dementia? 
In Alzheimer's disease, as you can see in the figure, the hippocampus becomes smaller, it's shrinkage, uh, the cortex shrinkage, and there, there are uh, damaged nerves and toe tangles and amyloid plaque development. So this leads to gradual decline in memory and other cognitive abilities. And there are also modifications in the blood-brain barrier, oxidative stress, mitochondrial impairment, neuroinflammation, and alterations in the insulin signaling. All of these are very much relevant because we're going to talk about how uh, diet can actually reduce this effect. And the good news is that um, the, there is a live course model that uh, of modifiable or non-modifiable risk factors to dementia. And nutrition is actually a modifiable environmental risk factor. And this can contribute both directly by the provision of nutrients or indirectly via non-communicable disease to risk of dementia. Non-communicable disease can be diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and other disease that is related to brain health. And in actual fact, in uh, in, in Cyprus, as part of the New Age study led by Professor Gosandinilu, we looked at 640 participants aged 55 years and older, which were community dwellers in good general health and had a normal uh, brain function, and explored whether the met metabolic syndrome, which is a correlation of factors such as a constellation of factors such as, for example, blood glucose, high blood glucose, high blood cholesterol. Uh, high blood pressure, or its individual factors are associated with cognitive function. And we found that BMI, body mass index, which is the weight compared to the height, a high BMI and blood glucose predicted cognitive performance, even after allowing for age and education. So these are two important factors to be looking at, which are relevant to diet, of course. Um, it's important to note that the focus recently has not been, in terms of nutrition, has not been on individual vitamins and phytochemicals such as what was in the past. We now know that it's more important to look at dietary patterns, such as, for example, the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, and look at the effect of the whole dietary pattern on brain aging. And this is a very nice slide because it actually shows that the, uh, a healthy diet can actually help in low amyloid pathology and high metabolism in the brain compared to an unhealthy diet, which does the opposite. So if you take uh, anything today from this webinar, remember this slide, it's extremely important that you can do something for your brain by eating more healthily you can reduce your brain's age. So the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is one of those dietary patterns that is in the spotlight for its effects on the brain. And in actual fact, I thought I'd show you this because some of you might not realize where I am at the moment, but I am in the Mediterranean Sea. I am here, this is Cyprus. Uh, I am in Nicosia, which is here. And I am in the Mediterranean Sea, and in the Mediterranean diet, uh, or countries in the Mediterranean Sea, share something common, which is the olive tree. The olive tree that produces olive, olives, of course, and olive oil. And this is the center of the Mediterranean diet. So what is the Mediterranean diet? Mediterranean diet is a plant-based diet where there's lots of consumption of uh, legumes, whole grain products, fruits, vegetables, all fresh and seasonal, uh, lots of extra virgin olive oil, a lot of fish, less uh, consumption of poultry, cheese and eggs, and on the top, so um, very rare consumption is actually sweets and red meat. Red, red wine is consumed with meals, but in small amounts, a lot of water, and then, of course, there's also family eating, uh, spending time with uh, friends and family, exercising. All of these are part of the Mediterranean lifestyle. And here you can see the Mediterranean diet in a plate form. So back in 2016, we, we were interested to see whether the Mediterranean diet is actually associated with cognitive function and dementia. 
and we systematically reviewed the evidence. And here, what this slide shows is that all the studies, whether they were associations with Mediterranean diet and dementia or cognitive impairment or cognitive function, all were either protective or had no effect. There was nothing that was negative about the effect of the Mediterranean diet on cognition. But because the evidence was mostly observational, no causational so we recommended more randomized controlled trials to provide empirical evidence. Since then, though, there have been, uh, I will show you just a couple of very big studies that have been done. This one is the Singapore Chinese Health Study involving a huge number of adults, almost 17,000 adults. And here they assess diet quality using uh, four different scores, health rating scores. And cognitive function was evaluated by a Singapore modified mini mental examination test. And what the study showed is that the risk of cognitive impairment was uh, about almost more than 30% lower uh, if the person adhered more to the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, which is very similar a lot of plants, a lot of vegetables, legumes. Um, and um, low salt. But the strongest association was for the Mediterranean diet, followed by the DASH diet, and the rest of the diets here also were associated, but not as strongly. Another study uh, in a very different population group in the UK, again, a huge number, at more than 8,000 older individuals. Here they looked at associations between the Mediterranean diet and global and domain-specific cognitive test scores 15 years later, but they looked at the entire cohort, but also stratified to cardiovascular risk status. And they found that people that had a high risk of cardiovascular disease were more likely to have better cognitive function if they adhered to the Mediterranean diet. So it's very important to actually pay attention to those people that are at higher cardiovascular risk. And we should be doing more studies on these people. Future randomized controlled trials should actually test how we can actually help this particular group of people. Another thing to look at is dietary glycemic index, something that um, I really like to explore. The diet glycemic index is um, a way of measuring or examining how much blood glucose increases after consumption of something that we eat containing carbohydrates. So this is a change in blood glucose and the red line shows you the change in blood glucose following consumption of what we call high glycemic index food, such as for example, white bread. And the, the, you can see there is a sudden increase followed by a sudden drop. And the blue line shows you what happens if we eat something with a low glycemic index, where there is a, a slow increase and not so sudden and not so high, followed by a slow reduction in blood glucose. An example of such a food would be seeded bread. And since the brain relies on glucose for its function, obtained mainly from carbohydrate-containing foods, we hypothesize that if we consume a low glycemic index diet, such as in the blue line, this would be associated with a better cognitive function due to a more constant postprandial, which means after eating blood glucose concentration. So we studied um, in the nine, uh, members of the 1946 British birth cohort, one of the oldest cohorts held, uh, birth cohorts, and we studied the prospective associations of diet GI at age 53 years old and outcomes of cognitive function at age 69, and also the rate of decline. And we showed that if they consumed a high glycemic index diet, they had worse verbal memory score and worse letter search speed compared to a low glycemic index diet, but only when we didn't um, control for any confounders. As soon as we controlled in this model three for cognitive abilities uh, at age 15, educational attainment and social class, all the findings were attenuated and there was no association. So we concluded that DIGI does not appear to predict cognitive functional decline, which was mainly explained by childhood cognitive ability, education, and socioeconomic class. 
And this is how we explained it. Higher cognitive uh, childhood ability increases knowledge about nutrition, leading to healthier dietary choices and better cognitive function as adults. Whereas a lower childhood cognitive ability uh, leads to less advantageous social circumstances as adults, a worse health, uh, health management, including diet, and worse cognitive function as adults. And I think this is why um, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition asked for me to write an editorial about this, because um, the, our findings were different to the findings that I showed you before, where there were associations. So one of the things that we aggregate here is that future observational research should take into account, whenever possible, of course, previous and, if possible, childhood cognitive function, in addition to uh, measuring very closely educational attainment, as these are important potential confounders. And if this is not done, there might be residual confounding, which cannot allow us to really study any associations as well. But saying that, there is evidence from uh, another birth cohort, 1936 birth cohort this time, where they actually looked at brain structure. And what they did here is that they took, um, they looked at a Mediterranean type diet and change in brain MRI volumetric measures and mean cortical thickness across a three year period. And they found that greater adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with the lower total brain atrophy over a three year period. So that's why I said at the beginning that eating healthily can actually do, do, do good to your brain. And this is interesting because what they also found was that fish and meat consumption were not associated with total brain volume or gray matter volume. So they concluded that the Mediterranean diet is not just the sum of its components. So this is, um, this is very important because it's not about just consuming fish or just consuming, not consuming meat, but we need to look at the whole diet and consume the whole diet. Another very interesting slide is this one, where they actually showed that consumption of the Mediterranean diet helps the brain have uh, a better glucose metabolism and less beta amyloid load compared to not consuming the Mediterranean diet. So real brains and real people. So I would say that if there is something to remember, is that diet and cognitive function is not just about, uh, as I said before, consuming one food and not consuming another, or just taking some supplements of one ingredient and not thinking about anything else. Uh, since nutrients coexist in foods, foods and nutrients interact or act in synergy when influencing metabolic processes. Consumption of one food or food group may lead the consumption of another food, and we need a long follow-up period to actually study the effects of foods and their interactions. Um, and as we said before, the Mediterranean diet is not just the sum of its components. So this is a key take-home message. Nutrients work synergistically. They work together. That's why dietary patterns are more effective than individual consumption of foods. So what about evidence from randomized controlled trials now? The first evidence came from the PREDIMED Navarra study, where they looked at 500, more than 500 participants that were at high cardiovascular risk, and they asked them to follow the Mediterranean diet for six and a half years, either supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or supplemented with nuts, or follow um, a controlled diet which was low fat. And they assessed mini mental state examination test and clock drawing test only at the end of the intervention. This is a very basic uh, brain uh, function test. They found that people who were adhering to the Mediterranean diet, either uh, supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or with nuts, had uh, uh, improved global co cognition. And this benefit was independent of other potential confounders. And in another center of the PREDIMED study, again, the same uh, intervention, but in a different study center, 
they did something different because they measured more uh, cognitive outcomes and they measured them both at the beginning and at the end of the uh, intervention. They followed the people up for four years and again they found that uh, there was better memory, frontal cognition and global con cognition after the intervention of the Mediterranean diet. In another part of the world, in Australia, they decided to do a six-month randomized control uh, study where they took 137 healthy men and women, uh, 70, mean age 72 years old, and they randomly allocated to the Mediterranean diet group or a control diet, which was their usual diet. They assessed cognition using what we call a battery of 11 different tests, or a lot of different tests, and here this slide shows you that the people that were randomized to the Mediterranean diet actually changed everything that they were eating towards the recommended. So they ate more extra virgin olive oil, fruit, vegetables, legumes, etc., and less meat. But this slide shows you that even though they did everything that they were asked, there were no effects of the diet, no significant differences between groups. So why is that? Why do we see that in randomized controlled trials, not all trials show us the same or similar result? First of all, it might be that we need to intervene for a big or a number of years before we see any outcomes. The second study, the Australian study, was only for six months. So maybe we need to be doing something for a few years or start now, you know, at any age and follow this through uh, for the rest of our lives. And um, of course, the study samples were different. Also, in the pregnant study, people were at high cardiovascular risk, which might have uh, effects, uh, might, might be more beneficial to consume a healthy diet. There might be genetics, epigenetic, or diet, gene and diet interactions that we don't know of. Another point of interest is that the pregnant study was actually supplemented with extra ingredients, extra virgin olive oil, they gave them one liter a week to consume within the family, or they asked them to consume about 30 grams of uh, the nuts, unsalted nuts. So these people were eating a lot more monounsaturated um, fatty acids, polyphenols, phenolic antioxidants. This might change the synergistic chemistry among ingredients. Whereas in the medley study, it was just uh, the Mediterranean diet not supplemented with anything else. So the question is, do we consume just the Mediterranean diet or do we need to supplement it with some extra ingredients? And I will give a possible answer to that later on. Uh, of course, the matter of education is very important because in the medley study, they had uh, people that were highly educated and generally healthy. Education might preserve cognitive function. This is, uh, there is, the, they might have had a high cognitive reserve, uh, meaning that the effects of uh, anything else on their brain might not be so easy to show uh, because the brain is able to function uh, better uh, by preserving its abilities. In another study, a one-year randomized controlled trial in this case of five European centers, here they took 1,279 relatively healthy older adults and they randomized them to two groups, the control group following a habitual diet and the intervention group that was given a tailored dietary advice based on the Mediterranean diet. And they looked at a number of different um, cognitive outcomes using a number of different tests. In this study, they found that only participants which had a higher adherence to the NUH diet showed statistically significant improvements. Those participants that adhered a little bit to the diet did not have uh, any improvement. So another take home message is to eat healthily, but eat uh, healthily of all the components. And again, don't do it uh, only for a little bit of time or uh, a little bit of those uh, particular foods. So, how might the Mediterranean diet protect against cognitive decline? There are a number of different mechanisms relating, for example, to cardioprotective effects. We know that the Mediterranean diet reduces the risk of cardiovascular events, and we know that uh, cardiovascular disease increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. 
Another one is the reduction in the risk of metabolic syndrome and diabetes. There is robust evidence for a greater adherence to the Mediterranean diet and metabolic syndrome and diabetes. There's actually a huge umbrella meta-analysis that has uh, shown this, uh, if anyone is interested. It provides anti-inflammatory uh, foods, and we know that the adherence to the Mediterranean diet is actually related to a lower concentration of C-reactive protein and interleukin. And if uh, the chronic inflammation, we also know that is related to uh, deposits of alpha beta amyloids and decreases blood flow and also um, uh, causes dysfunction in the brain. The Mediterranean diet also reduces oxidative stress because it provides a lot of uh, vitamins and polyphenols, phytochemicals, which have a very uh, high antioxidant uh, ability. And lastly, something new, it alters the microbiome. And we know that the um, gut bacterial diversity favoring the bifidobacterium over E. coli ratio, a growth of bacterides and production of short chain fatty acids, all of these are related to better growth, uh, better brain function. Now, I wanted to add a little bit about another trend, which is the ketogenic diet, and show you some evidence uh, of whether this kind of diet might also be protective. Ketogenic diet is a diet that induces and maintains a state of ketosis. State of ketosis is a metabolic condition where the body mainly uses ketone bodies instead of glucose as a major fuel. Remember, we said before that the brain needs to use glucose, but it can also use ketone bodies. What will happen if there is ketosis is that mitochondrial of the neuronal cells in the brain are able to oxidize. Um, the acetoaspartic acid and beta hydroxybutyric acids, which are all ketone bodies producing acetyl CoA. Ketosis has a neuroprotective effect, uh, and ketones may function as an alternative source of energy to cerebral neurons. So, why for cognitive decline? Because impairment of the brain's glucose utilization is an early feature of Alzheimer's disease which may be associated with local brain insulin resistance. Remember insulin resistance in the brain because we'll come to it in a minute. And the metabolism of ketone bodies mimics some actions of insulin and can overcome insulin resistance in the brain. So here's a study that was done uh, quite recently. Here we have 20 Japanese uh, patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. They underwent two trials. In the first trial, they had to drink uh, 50 grams of a ketogenic formula, and uh, they took uh, some neurocognitive tests 120 minutes after consuming this formula. And, the, and also, another day, they took placebo formula. And in the second trial, they had to take this formula for up to 12 weeks, and then they underwent neurocognitive tests monthly. The results in the first trial, the plasma levels of ketone bodies were successfully increased, so there was ketone bodies in their blood, but there was no significant difference in any of the cognitive outcomes. In the second trial, though, there were positive effects on verbal memory and processing speed in patients with Alzheimer's disease after consuming for 12 weeks the ketogenic formula. And the authors concluded that the results may be, may be derived from a chronic beneficial effect of the ketogenic formula on insulin resistance rather than from the acute effect of the ketogenic formula as an alternative fuel. But there are some protective, proposed protective mechanisms of ketogenic diet. It might reduce beta amyloids, uh, reduce inflammation, reduce oxidation in the brain, reduce atherosclerosis, plaque formation, and all of these lead to neuroprotection. However, there are some concerns, and as a registered dietitian, I need to raise this. The ketogenic diet has side effects. First of all, it reduces appetite. This is very important because if we have um, a frail elderly patient with malnutrition, and then we give them something that reduces their appetite, we might end up with more risk. It, has, it might also cause gastrointestinal problems, diuresis, which might lead to dehydration. 
uh, it can lead to hypoglycemia, sometimes life-threatening, and also increases the risk of sarcopenia, so loss of muscle, due to insufficient intake of dietary protein, because mainly you're eating a lot of fat. Uh, it is not a balanced diet. It takes away a lot of the nutrients that we talked about before. It does not provide antioxidants like chemicals, enough dietary fiber, because you're not supposed to be eating lots of fruits, vegetables, or legumes, or whole grains. It is not practical or easy to apply under normal circumstances. And there are also regards, concerns regarding uh, use of this diet in people with type 2 diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and disordered eating patterns. So if anyone or, uh, is thinking of using such a diet on their patients or on themselves, they need to consult with a specialist first, and they need to modify their medication with obviously consultation with their doctor and follow this only for a short period of time. Also, um, it's not here, but I had a slide that uh, showed that the, the outcomes, uh, the studies that have been done up to now are mostly in animals, so in mice and uh, cells and not so many in humans. And all of the ones that were done in humans are small studies. So we need to wait and see for more evidence. So what about modifying the Mediterranean diet and making it even better for the brain and also easy to apply? Here we have the MIND diet, which is basically a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. And the MIND diet emphasizes a lot of consumption of leafy, green leafy vegetables, uh, like you can see here. Uh, nuts, berries, uh, limiting consumption of cheese and fast dried food. Here you can see exactly what uh, the amounts are. And with this diet, it has been shown that it can actually, uh, if someone adheres to the mind diet, it can actually lead to seven and a half years younger in age for their brain health. So it's worth. Um, adhering to the MIND diet. And based on this, and based on all the evidence that I showed you, we produced an IEP uh, uh, to actually uh, give the evidence and um, the title of this food for thought, basic nutrition recommendations for the mature brain. This was a work developed by the Neurogenerative Diseases Networking Group and the Culinary Medicine Task Force. What did we say in here? So there are very basic nutrition recommendations that actually uh, have been shown based on the evidence that we have up to now to make a difference for the aging brain. Eat whole grains with every meal. Eat different types of fruit and vegetables every day. Eat legumes three or more times per week. Limit red meat to once or twice a week. Focus on healthy fats. Don't forget about dark chocolate. This is a good one because dark chocolate provides uh, phytochemicals that are important for brain health. Spice up with your meals with herbs and spices. Stay hydrated. Have a moderate but not excessive caffeine intake. If you consume alcohol, enjoy a glass of red wine with meals. And balance your meals and do not overeat. And just a couple of thoughts before I close. We looked at the evidence. We looked at what is missing. So there are some things that we still don't know. We're not sure whether uh, the, diet, the dietary patterns that I showed you are preventing or preserving. Uh, whether people with mild cognitive uh, impairment might benefit more or less, or at which stage to intervene. I would say the best bet is to treat healthily uh, from mid-age or even younger when and for how long we need to intervene if we want to make a difference. We're not sure whether there is what we call reverse causation, what I showed you before, that people who are already at a higher educational level have a higher cognitive ability, choose better food, and these people are the ones that end up having a better cognitive function. We're not sure how much uh, other lifestyle and social factors make a difference. Which foods are perhaps even more important to consume, and which are the gene diet interactions that we need to know of. 
So it's important to remember that diet is only one piece of the prevention puzzle. Don't forget that lifestyle medicine also um, includes other pieces in order to uh, help the brain be at its best. Physical activity, and I will refer you to an IP uh, prepared by members of this group. Good quality sleep is extremely important. Keeping a healthy weight, checking our cardiovascular health, doing annual checkups, stopping smoking, reducing stress, mental health, avoiding depression, lifelong learning is extremely important, and new skill development and socializing. And I would like to also take the chance to introduce you to my YouTube channel. Here I have uh, only a few videos up to now, but one of them is about eating to nourish your brain. So you can check this out and you will find important information on what we just talked about. And feel, feel free to share. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, you can, um, I can answer any questions in the chat box, but also please email me later if you think of anything else that we would like to discuss. Thank you very much. So we have one chat. Um, ah, okay. So if you have any questions, please uh, send them in the chat box. What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. That was so uh, insightful, uh, needed. Uh, we all need to learn about that and change our eating behaviors. And uh, such a good time to do that, uh, to make our mm -hmm. body and metabolism stronger. And uh, that's uh, so helpful. Uh, maybe what I'm going to do, if you don't uh, oppose, Dr. Filippo, is maybe to open, uh, we have a small group, and uh, I can just open for questions, um, that way people can um, more verbally participate. So let me see here if it allows me to do that. Perhaps you need to become the presenter, perhaps. Yep, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> so I apologize. I would love to open for some verbal uh, discussion, but uh, if anyone has any question, please, uh, I will moderate and uh, I can ask uh, to our um chat box okay here we have a question from dr hirsch who is uh the ndng chair and so he's asking what is the evidence supporting coffee consumption for neuroprotection that's a good one i'm still drinking my coffee what is the evidence supporting coffee, coffee. drinking coffee coffee, coffee. Consumption for neuroprotection Okay, this is an interesting one. Um, what, uh, what we know for coffee is that moderate consumption actually increases uh, concentration and um, memory. And in the, in the long term, what we know is that consumption of coffee actually reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease. So contrary to what we thought in the past, moderate coffee consumption, in some studies even actually a bit higher than moderate, was shown to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes and, and also Alzheimer's disease and dementia. One of the things that uh, the studies were not able to, to show, and this is a problem with association studies, is a, a question that I have, is perhaps sometimes we drink our coffee while socializing. So is it the socializing effect of uh, that does the job, or is it the coffee drinking that does the job? So it's one of those questions that I still have in my head, whether that is um, uh, the missing link. Perfect. And I have an, a question for you too. So it's so mm -hmm. important uh, that uh, those um, lifestyle uh, modifications and habits start so early. So are there any studies that are following since uh, 
childhood, they have that uh, long term observation and outcome impact on those uh, key outcomes for neurogeneration. Yeah, um, to my knowledge, I, I I need to check on that, but I don't I haven't seen a study looking at all the different lifestyle factors together. But uh, studies like, for example, the 1946 birth cohort, which is one of the oldest ones. So the people now would be something like 70, uh, 74 years old, or the 1936 uh, Lothian birth cohort looked at individual factors. So they would look at sleep, they would look at diet, they would look at social interactions. But I'm not aware of any study looking at everything together. But you're now making me go and check because <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, and um, so I'll, I will email if I find anything. Yeah, it, it's very interesting because we know like, uh, you know, there's no good time to start good habits. So any time point is always good and we always get some improvements. But probably mm -hmm. what is the most uh, critical point in the development that uh, those can have really a very lasting and impactful effect. So is that uh, when we are very early in our childhood development or before the 30s? And so I think it's also um, important that um, we move from that uh, time point of aging after the age of 60 and start to look um, how those uh, modifications can have uh, a better impact if we start to uh, look at an earlier time point in the aging, the human development. Absolutely. And also, I think, although I'm not in favor of just taking supplements, even for supplements, we need to consider the right dose because in the past, there have been many studies that um, didn't use the right doses of different omega-3, for example. And now some new studies, they look they use huge doses. And these huge doses were able to reduce mild cognitive impairment uh, a little bit, but still to the person, it would be of benefit. So it, I think there is a lot of room for research in this area. And the matter of adhering to the diet, because when you do human studies, um, randomized controlled trials, you know, on paper, it looks, it looks okay, but when you actually have to do it, people don't really adhere a lot of times to what you tell them to do, or you're not, you cannot be sure whether they do that. So this is a very important thing to, for nutrition to start thinking about how we can better do studies better. I agree. So, Let's see, do we have uh, any questions from our enduring attendees? Uh, that uh, I wanna thank you so much for coming to our webinar today. Let's see our- Thank you very much. Let's see our co-facilitator, co-chair of the seminar, Julie. Um, I don't know if you are being able. Okay, there's Julie. Julie, do you have any comments uh, as your task force uh, was so critical in sponsoring this uh, wonderful webinar? Well, I just want to say thank you. Um, this was an incredible webinar, so much good information packed in. And I'd just like to uh, point out that you did a wonderful job of making it very understandable for us who are not in dietetics. So I'm already a fan of your YouTube channel. If anybody else on this call is not already following um, uh, the YouTube channel that, that Elena pointed out, is that written on the chat by chance? If you want to put the um, link on the chat. I can, I can write that, yeah. Um, and one of the next uh, films, videos would be on the immune system. So that would be good to, uh, to watch. Uh, if you just search Dr. Elena Filippo on YouTube, you, you'll be able to find it. It's the easiest way. And uh, tell me about the YouTube program. So what, what is the goal? And um, if you can tell us a little bit um, how you are developing that and the impact. The, the YouTube, I, I can't, I think when, 
two microphones are on. I can't hear very well. Um, so can you can you please repeat? Yes. Can you tell us about your YouTube channel and uh, what you have been doing and uh, the achievements? Yes. Thank you. And um, I decided to create a YouTube channel because I see that a lot of information on YouTube is actually not scientific and everyone just um, comes up and puts whatever they want on there. Uh, I, was, uh, I thought, you know, it takes a lot of work, uh, but uh, it's very enjoyable and whatever I say, I try to base it on, no, I try, I, I read and I base it on research. And there are now four videos. Um, one is on uh, low glycemic index diets and insulin resistance. A glycemic index is what I did my PhD on, so it's really something that I, I love. Um, the other one is on this, Eat to Nourish Your Brain, based on the nutrition recommendations that we developed here as a group. And so I'm trying to raise awareness on those nutrition recommendations so that people can follow them. And the other video is on chronic nutrition, when to eat. And the first video is on compulsive overeating, so for people who eat because of stress or uh, other emotional reasons. And most all the videos that are to come will be related to, to, to health. Uh, so anyone uh, who has any ideas, can, um, thank you, uh, can actually uh, email, email with ideas and we can develop. And Julie has done a great job putting some tips as well together, perhaps, um, Julie can also talk about her, her videos, they're lovely. I think you're muted. Uh, Thank you. Julie. I'll talk okay. briefly about that and then I might add one more question if we have time. So yes, we have, um, I've shared a few of Alina's um, hints and tips through some easy to understand animation videos on um, my social media sites called Silver Science uh, 20. And so I'll put that in the chat box as well. Oops, I need to change it to everyone. Um, and then Elena, I wondered if you had any information on something I've been hearing about a little bit more recently as far as supplements and forgive me if I say it wrong, but that's acetyl L-carnitine. Um, and so I've been seeing a bit more about the potential benefits of that as a supplement, um, along with other things like green tea supplements and things of that nature to help support um, an aging brain. And so I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that or opinions on supplementation. Um, for, to be honest, the, the particular one, I, I, I wouldn't say I have a lot of information. Uh, but I'm happy to look into it, and you know, it's it's always good to learn um, new new things. The the one thing that I wanted to say about supplements in general, though, and what what we know from the evidence, the general evidence, is that if someone is deficient, uh, specifically in the B vitamins, vitamin B12, folic acid, uh, and other B vitamins and this is quite common in all the populations, they need to definitely uh, take the supplement and uh, uh, they overcome the deficiency, sorry. And the other one to be really aware of is vitamin D because vitamin D seems to also be related to uh, any of these problems. I mean, in general, vitamin D deficiency is very common and we need to think about that. So all the, all the information we have up to now about supplementation is never take supplements without a reason because some of the supplements have been shown to actually cause more problems, more problems, especially for uh, um, bone health. Um, now for the other supplement that seems to make a difference is omega-3 fatty acids and that has been shown uh, to make a small difference in memory. So meta-analysis, a recent meta-analysis that came out showed that omega-3 fatty acids make a um, uh, benefit to uh, memory function. Now, for the one you asked me, I, uh, I'm trying to see if I can find any information at the moment, but I will check that out, acetyl L-carnitine. Um, I will check can it out I and get back to you. 
the the things I've seen with you and then perhaps that might be something that we see on your YouTube yeah. channel in the future. Definitely. Thank you. That's I great. think it's an antioxidant. Uh, it's an antioxidant amino acid. Um, this is what I can find. I, I, I am not specifically aware about the, the specific supplements. Well, I think we're going to end, but we have one more question from Mark, and um, that's a great way to end the webinar because uh, we are working with Elena for a sequel webinar on um, nutrition for COVID. So actually, Mark brought that uh, issue, like what is uh, some of the recommendations for frail and uh, for um, uh, neurodegenerative patients and individuals about uh, best eating for during the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I know you are preparing this very exciting webinar and content for that. So please go ahead and yeah. incite us. Mm -hmm. I think the, the first thing to check and make sure someone uh, sorts out uh, for, for the immune system, for COVID and anything else, is their weight. So for COVID in particular, it shows, the evidence shows that people who are obese and overweight, they have a higher risk of uh, complications and death from COVID, but also frailty. So being underweight is also uh, a risk factor. So uh, gradually either reduce or gain weight in a healthy way would be the first step to, to get a better immune response. And then the vitamin, uh, if I was to choose one vitamin to talk about today, I would say that would be vitamin D. Vitamin D has been um, the one that ha has gained most of the attention because it's related to lung function. And we knew from before that people who with deficiency in vitamin D were at higher risk of uh, problems with their lungs and inflammation or even coughing and everything else related to lung function. So. Uh, a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D and they don't realize it. And I think even uh, after the quarantine that we all have been at home for so many days uh, without any sun exposure, more people would be deficient or have insufficient vitamin D. Even in Cyprus, we have so much sun and so many people have insufficiency in vitamin D. So if at all possible, I would recommend having a blood test of vitamin D and taking supplements to sort that out before the fall because then there would be a high risk again from uh, the cold temperatures. And if not, if one cannot take, um, uh, a, cannot do a blood test, maybe take a supplement of one to 2,000 IU per day of vitamin D, because that uh, is the, requirement, the minimum requirement to uh, get your vitamin D uh, concentration in the blood up. And then the general healthy eating guidelines would be, would be extremely beneficial to follow. Yeah, yeah, and um, I'm I'm happy that uh, you touch um, briefly because um, I know this topic is so comprehensive, and uh, so we're going to be having a webinar and uh, some materials uh, that uh, you're going to be providing and uh, teaching about uh, this uh, important uh, uh, pandemic uh, that is affecting so many of uh, us and our patients. Uh, so without more um uh, further ado i want to again thank you so much that has been what a beautiful webinar and uh, this is recorded and it's going to be in our ndng website under the webinar series and uh, so we are going to be looking forward for the sequel of this uh, webinar with the COVID pandemic and uh, everyone here have been reading some of the chat and everyone is uh, very excited about uh, the webinar today. Yes, uh, just a small comment. Uh, Mark Hirsch wrote vitamin B, but um, I was talking about vitamin D before, just to just to be on the safe side, D. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.